Amen, amen, amen. It's so good to be in church tonight. Amen, amen. Go with me, if you would, over to Acts chapter 18, and then uh, also Acts 19. Just hang, hang out there a little bit. We're going to minister again tonight on um, the series that we've been in on a room where God can move. How many is received some good things from that. I know I have. I've received a lot of good things um, just in the last uh, few months, just in getting ready for that. But um, the purpose in, in going over these things, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one who's responsible for leading us the directions that we go. We got a lot of great sermons that are sitting on the shelf somewhere. And... Uh, <laughs> Every once in a while, the Holy Ghost will tell you to go pick it up and, and use it. But um, we believe that there's a right word for the right season. God's so faithful to do that for us. And um, the Holy Ghost kind of helps you to stay a step ahead. Have you noticed that? He, he helps you to kind of stay a step ahead. Um, and, and that's what I see that He's been doing for us in that he's really preparing our hearts for what he's doing right now. God wants to move in our midst. I'm telling you, God has a plan to move in this earth. He's getting people ready for heaven. Hallelujah. He's getting people ready to meet the Lord. And that's why we're seeing His Spirit poured out. That's why we're seeing the Holy Spirit moving the way that He is right now. Glory to God. And we want to be open to that. We want um, the room, the environment, the midst of our life to be a place where God can come in and do what He wants to do and have His way. We, we saw in the Scriptures early in this, in this series that Jesus went into places. He went into Nazareth with intentions to bless them, with intentions to minister to them. And he could there do no mighty work. It was just saturated with unbelief. And so there is a cooperation that we as God's people have with God. It isn't that God just comes in and does whatever He wants to do to anybody, anywhere. There has to be an openness. There has to be a, a spirit of faith. There has to be a spirit of unity involved between us and God and us and one another. God moves in certain places like that. And so we want to make sure that our lives, our church... Our family, our home, our business is, a, is, is set, to we set the tone for that to be a place where God can come in and do what He wants to do. Amen? And so uh, we talked about uh, being a place where uh, faith is there and where uh, unity is there. He moves in those kinds of environments. Where, we, where we've been talking about is that God moves in places where there's an, an invitation, an openness to the Holy Spirit. And I've been so blessed. I've been, you know, watching where, you know, all these universities are having a move of God. Praise God. I'm so excited about that. You know, and... And in just listening to some of the accounts of people that have gone, I know some people that actually went and, and shared their experience. They said what's happening is just there's just an overwhelming presence of the Lord. There's just an overwhelming uh, presence and tangibility of the love of God. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, well, you know, we've experienced that here in our church. I know there's a lot of churches that experience that every Sunday, experience that every Wednesday. The thing is, is that God will move to the degree that you're open. And so when I talk about being open to the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about just being open to the presence of God. 
just open to um, the tangibility of the love of God, there is a fullness. And that's what we've been talking about. There's a fullness to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And if you're not open to the fullness, you will not experience the fullness. When we talk about the fullness, yes, we're talking about the presence of God. When we talk about the fullness, we're also talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. Not just baptism in water, though that is a baptism. Not just being baptized into the body of Christ. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. But there's a separate experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord gives you a heavenly language. Praise God. I know a lot of times that you know, phrase tongues throws people off. That's a heavenly language given to you by God where you can pray, you can build yourself up on your most holy faith, you can uh, edify yourself. There's just so many things that the Holy Spirit helps us with. But there's a fullness. There's um, the, the gifts of the Spirit. There's the working of miracles. There's the gifts of healing. There's, um, you know, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. There's all these things that the Holy Spirit wants to do if we're open. There's impartations. You know, we talked about that a few uh, months back about how the Holy Spirit, that's the manifestation of the Spirit, is that He will impart things to you by the laying on of hands. You know, there's people that are not open to that. There's the joy of the Lord. That You know, the joy is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. You know, we saw that several years ago where just the spirit of joy, or we called it a revival of joy, hit the church. And you have people that still today don't believe that that was from God. But it was. And it still is. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is a spirit of joy. Righteousness. What? Peace. And what else? Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy is a part of the glory of God. And so, are we open? Are we open? Because I'm telling you, God's moving right now. He's moving right now like rain all over the world. Hallelujah. I mean, He is just sad. You know what we're seeing in California? Just this saturation of of moisture and rain that's coming into our, our state. I'm telling you, that's how the Holy Spirit is moving all over the world. He's moving in the Philippines mighty revival happening in the Philippines. He's moving in the Arab world. I don't know if you've heard the accounts, but an unprecedented number of Muslims are converting to Christianity because they're having supernatural experiences of visions and dreams of Jesus Christ and they're giving their hearts to Him, making Him the Lord of their life. Something's happening in the earth today. Hallelujah. He's moving right now. And so I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit for putting us on this track to where we can get our hearts ready. Does that make sense? We can can have our hearts ready for whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. If it's joy, I'm open. Mm -hmm. If it's impartation, I'm open. (laughs) If it's the gift of the Spirit, I'm open. Whatever it is, I'm open. I'm ready, hallelujah, for the Holy Spirit to move on me. I'm ready to receive what He has. Are you? Hallelujah. And so, uh, where we kind of left off, we were talking about having an openness towards the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the reason I want to start there is because 
that's really kind of the entryway for the rest. It really is. For, for the rest of, of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in your own personal life, the, the baptism of the Holy, Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is kind of the entryway. And you need to have an openness towards the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me just read, uh, let me just read a couple of verses to you. Um, Luke, Luke 29 and 49. I know you all are in Acts. And we've read this already. You know, in the next couple of weeks, we're probably going to read some scriptures that we've already uh, went over before. But that's okay. You know, we're, 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 we're doing some foundational things right here. We need to have a strong foundation as to why we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The majority of the body of Christ doesn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. It's just true. But we need to be firm. We need to be strong. In the, it's, it's a foundational thing. And so I'm really excited that the Lord wants to build us up in this. Amen. Build up, build up our understanding in, in these scriptures. But here in Luke 29, 49, this is uh, Jesus speaking. He said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so he was talking about the Holy Ghost. Every believer needs the equipping of the Holy Spirit. He told them, don't go anywhere. Don't go preaching to anybody. Go wait. Go wait until you're endued with power from on high. Why? Because we need the equipping of God's Spirit in our life. We need the Holy Ghost. Jesus needed the Holy Ghost. Jesus needed the Holy Ghost. If you look at his life and you look at his ministry, he didn't do anything. He didn't multiply fishes and loaves. He didn't turn any water into wine until he was equipped with the power of the Holy Ghost. He went down to the River Jordan where John, his cousin, was and he was baptized in water and then the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Hallelujah. And that was the equipping that he needed to fulfill the assignment that was on his life. You know, and he talked about that. Read the Gospels. He talked about that with his disciples he talked to them about the new covenant life that we are partaking of and enjoying today that's what he was talking to them about not just you know once the early church got established and then that was it no this was for the new covenant people which is you and me and he said i'm sending you a helper i'm sending you the holy ghost hallelujah and he's going to equip you for what you're called to do. He's going to equip you for your assignment in life. That equipping comes to you through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so everybody needs, everybody needs to be filled with the Spirit. Now I'm going to just read a couple of things to you. Um, just bear with me. I don't even know what time it is. But we're not tearing down tonight, so praise the Lord. So that gives me... That gives me at least an extra 30 minutes, right? Not 30 minutes, but we'll, we might take an extra 10. Are you over in Acts 18? <laughs> you know, yes, we're going to take my time. I think sometimes people think the Holy Spirit is optional. But it was emphasized in the Bible. It was emphasized with the church. 
It was emphasized by Jesus. It was emphasized by Paul. I want, I want to read this to you in Acts 18 and 24. Are you there? Here you see the early Christians sharing with people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 18 and 24 it says, In a certain man named Apollos, remember when Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and then God gave the increase? This is the Apollos that he's talking about. Apollos was a minister. And it says here in verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus, and this man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was a good man. I mean, he had a strong passion for God. goes on to say, um, it goes on to say, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Now look at this, knowing only, say only, <laughs> the baptism of John. It specifically mentions that. He only knew the baptism of John. What was the baptism of John? Remember what John said, I baptize with water. But there's one coming greater after me, what? That will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So here, Apollos was not spirit-filled. He only knew water baptism. It specifically says that. He goes on to say this, verse 26, And he began to speak, boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Let me read it to you out of the CJB. It says, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God in, further, in, in fuller detail they begin to share with him the fullness because he only knew the baptism of John. He just knew the baptism of water. But they took him aside and began to share with him what? The full, he was saved. He'd been baptized in water, but how many of you know there's more? There's more. See, it's totally scriptural for us because I've heard people, you know, well, you guys just shouldn't make a big deal. You know, if you, if you want to be spirit-filled, that's up to you, but you shouldn't make people feel bad if they're not. We're not trying to make anybody feel bad. We're trying to expound and share with them that there's a fullness. There's more than just the experience of salvation. Thank God for that. There's more than just the experience of water baptism. Thank God for that. There is the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Now look at Paul. Go over to Acts 19. Here we see it again. We're going to get into something real good tonight, but I need to share these things with you because people just think that this is... A, a little footnote in the Bible, and it's not. Here's Paul, Acts 19 and verse 1, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost? Since you believed, since you've been born again, have you received the Holy Ghost? Have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? That's what he's talking about. And if you look down in verse 6, just drop down to verse 6. Well, let me finish that. And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. That's a lot of believers today. 
That's a lot of believers today. They, they've never heard that there's anything available to them concerning the Holy Spirit. It's either all about Jesus or all about the Father and nothing about the Holy Ghost. But if you drop down to verse 6, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied. So this is talking again about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul did not just go around sharing the gospel. He went around sharing the gospel and he shared about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was emphasized in the ministry of the church and it was emphasized in the ministry of Paul and it was emphasized in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is Savior, hallelujah, but he is also the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit. Now, <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me that you have different responses from people. You have some people that are so hungry for God that when they see this, I mean, they're ready. They're hunting you down after church to take you somewhere so that you can lay hands on them and they can be filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? They're wanting this experience. But then you have other people. I don't know if they tolerate it because they come to church. You know what I'm saying? They come to your church. And they see people running around and they see, you know, people being blessed and, and, and they, you know, um, are present in the service when... You know, we begin to lift up our heart and pray about different things and pray in the Spirit. But when presented with their spiritual choice whether to receive the Holy Spirit, they pass. Why do people pass on the Holy Ghost? That's what Jeremy said. There's some people, I think, because of an attitude of, I'm doing okay, I don't think I need that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? I'm like, I don't need that. The preacher needs it because he preaches. And he needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And Martin, you know, he goes out and he, he preaches to all these young people that are not set. He really needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but I'm just this, or I'm, and I'm okay. I don't, think, I don't think I really need that in my life. You know, I, I was... I was just meditating on this for the last couple of days. I didn't know exactly which direction I was going to go tonight, but we're, we're going this direction. I, I don't think sometimes we really put enough weight on the spiritual choices we make. We make choices all the time. I mean, I made a choice that I was going to make meatloaf for dinner. And that's what we did, had meatloaf for dinner. That's a choice. But it's really not that big of a deal. But the spiritual choices we make, we got to own them. And there's an outcome. I don't think sometimes people think about that. Well, I'm just going to leave that church and... I'm just not going to go to church at all. Well, think about the outcome of that. Because that's a spiritual choice. Well, 
I'm just not going to give or tithe or serve or, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But think about it. Those are spiritual choices. And spiritual choices have an outcome. And whether you want to believe it or not, you rejecting the equipping of the Holy Spirit which Jesus says you need, (laughs) that is a spiritual choice that has an outcome. Kind of quiet in here. I know that's kind of, we're thinking, we're thinking. But, But it's more than just a, well, you know, It's a spiritual choice. It's a spiritual decision you're making. And why do people pass? Why are some people just not even open? And and it got me to think, and I I had a conversation with a relative, and it really kind of got me on this. So we're kind of going to take a little side road, but we're we're still on it. Can can you just follow me tonight, and we'll, we'll get out of the weeds that we kind of need to get in the weeds on this because when it comes to the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're talking about, but this this affects other things too, prosperity, healing, miracles. Why do people make the choices they make about those things, whether to believe or reject them? There's a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for the choices we make, right? Right? reason I made meatloaf tonight is because Jeremy's going on that keto diet. So, you know, what I was going to make, I ain't going to make no more. I got stuff for meatloaf. Amen? There's a reason. There's a reason why people reject the Holy Spirit. It could be lack of understanding. We can fix that. If there's an open heart, we can fix that. Right? It could be pride. I don't really think I need it. Well, until you, I guess, either lay down the pride or uh, go through something (laughs) where you needed the Holy Ghost and you get tore up from the floor up because you're trying to do it in your own strength. That's not God's way, I'm just telling you. God's not putting you through something like that. But sometimes that's just what happens. Sometimes that's the outcome of the spiritual choices we make. But there's a couple of things that that came to me, and and I'm just going to kind of touch on them. Go go over to uh, Colossians 2. Go to Colossians 2. <clears throat> Why aren't people open to the Holy Spirit? Why aren't people open even to other truths that are in the Word of God? What's the reason? What's the reason? I think sometimes, and this is, I'll, I'm going to talk just about two things. I think sometimes society's view affects how far people go with the things of God in certain areas. I really think, especially maybe for the younger generation, I don't, you reach kind of an age, I think on there, where you just don't care. You know what I'm saying? So maybe this is more of the younger, but sometimes you deal with this even with older, older people too, where society kind of determines what they're going to do with these spiritual things. Well, you know, I just don't want to seem too radical. I think if I, if I get filled with the Spirit and my family knows about it or, you know, just people around me, you know, I just, I just want to be a normal Christian. I've heard that kind of stuff before. I just, I just want to be an, a normal Christian. I just want to kind of blend in with, with everybody else and not really stand out and, and not seem odd or, you know, well, 
what that's called, you know, there's a name for it. It's called societal norm. That's what it's called. You're wanting to be a part of the societal norm. You want to go along with what society or the majority looks at and says, oh, well, that's acceptable. That's okay. That's not radical. Therefore, you know, we're not going to persecute you. The problem with societal norms is that it's changing all the time. Is that not the truth? It's changing all the time. And the reason it's changing all the time is because the God of this world, Satan, is behind societal norms. I mean, this is why you have, you know, we have Christians that are like in different, you know, areas like sports, you know, they're uh, from Hollywood or, you know, you have people, well, you know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to be a light for Jesus Christ. Well, then they get in there and after like two years, you ask them, is Jesus the only way? Well, I don't, it's not for me to judge. No, you're a coward. You are a coward. You are a coward because you are now allowing society. And what society says is right to form your beliefs and your spiritual choices. A lot better preaching than the amen and in here. There, there's a scripture over in Romans. I know you're in Colossians, but let me, let me read this to you. Romans 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Classic. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs. The Bible says don't adapt. The Bible says don't conform to the world. Don't conform to the surroundings or to society. Why? Because I'm telling you, if that's what's on your radar and that's the standard by which you're going to make your spiritual choices by what the world says is okay, then you have to ask yourself, what parts of this book are you willing to throw out in order to fit in with them? Because... That's going to be necessary to live by their standard. Is it going to be uh, that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone? Is that the one you're willing to throw out to fit in with them? Because you see it all. You see all these Christians in, in Hollywood. Oh, well, you know, whatever name you call them, you are wrong. Well, you know, I used to not believe, you know, in certain lifestyles, but now, you know, I just believe that God is about love. And love is love. Oh, so you threw that one out. You threw out the standards for holy living so that you could fit, fit in with them. And I'm sure if that one's out the door, I'm sure that the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues is on the cutting room floor too. Because the world thinks that's wrong. The world deems that as unacceptable. The world deems that as 
from the devil. Praise the Lord. Why aren't you open to the truths of the Word of God? Is it because of society? That's your standard? Hallelujah. Another one that I think is big, and this is the second one. I'm not going to keep you here that long, but I, these, these are just some things that I wrote down a couple of days ago, and I, I just can't get away from it. We're going we're gonna to get into some really good stuff. But I think this is good, too. I, just, I, think, I think sometimes we got to think about this. And we got to come back to the truth. Like, what's right? Like, what's right? How do we determine what we believe about healing, prosperity? One, one of the things that hurts people is this. this. And this is one of the biggest reasons that I've had people come to me about as to why they reject the Holy Spirit, why they're not open, is because of their religious tradition. Their religious tradition. Um, a relative of mine, uh, we were talking a few weeks ago, and they were just kind of talking to me about how um, a few years ago they were going to a denominational church. Now, we were raised in a certain denomination, this relative and I, we were raised in a certain denomination. And they started going to a church that was of a different denomination that had a different belief system in a lot of things. And she said, I just couldn't go there. And I went to the pastor and I told him, you know, I was raised such and such and such and such and that's why I can't believe you know, some of the things that you preach. Well, I have to understand that I'm not everybody's pastor because, man, sometimes I hear something and it triggers something in me and I just pounce on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I'm, you know, I've got to be careful sometimes. That, okay, my family is not my congregation. <laughs> but I, I'm just sitting here just, you know, I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> that is tradition, religious tradition is not a good enough reason to accept or pass on anything. Now, what I'm going to say next, I'm not picking on the Baptist, okay? <laughs> but I'm just giving you an example because I have this said to me a lot. People will come up to me, we're talking about the Holy Ghost. Why aren't people open to the Holy Spirit? I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, well, you know what? I was raised Baptist. Mm -hmm. And the Baptists believe, and they teach that, you know, the Holy Spirit's not for today, and that it's not for everyone, you know, and, and it went away with the apostles and, and all them. So, you know, so uh, that's why, you know, I'm not uh, really looking to be filled with the Holy Ghost because I'm just, I'm just going with my Baptist tradition. And you got Pentecostals that do the same thing with think Catholics do the same thing, Methodists do the same thing. It's not a good enough reason. Your tradition is not a good enough reason. See, what tradition does is it causes you to prejudge things that you haven't even studied. You haven't even been taught about it. But you prejudge it. I mean, the, the, minute, the minute the pastor gets behind, this morning we're ministering on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they sit down, mm -mm, no, I don't believe that, I don't believe that one bit. I don't believe that one bit because I'm Baptist. I was raised Baptist. And you can, you can, pre, you know, you can prejudge anything. I prejudge oysters. I'm prejudiced against oysters. I've never ate one. I've never touched one. But I can judge it sitting in front of me on our table 
while Jeremy's, you know, getting his little napkin ready, you know, and he's, he's ready to eat it. And I'm just like, there is no way I'm sticking that in my, there is no way. I'm not doing it. Somebody, somebody invited us out to sushi. And Jeremy said, are you, are you getting ready for sushi Friday night? I said, I'm not getting ready for anything because I ain't eating it. I can tell you right now, I ain't eating it. I've prejudged it. And that's what a lot of people do about prosperity. Oh yeah, this is one of them name it, claim it churches. This is one of those churches that believe that you can prosper. Well, have you studied it? Have you studied prosperity in your Bible? Have you studied about the Holy Spirit from your own Bible? Have you studied healing? Have you studied miracles? Because I'm telling you, when you begin to study the Word of God, it begins to open up off the page. I know somebody that was talking about that. They were raised Baptist. Good old Southern Baptist. And this was back when uh, <laughs> Billy, Billy Graham, uh, you know, he was really big in, in the, the Baptist denomination. He encouraged... People in the Baptist denomination, when the, when the Living Bible came out, that was kind of a big thing when, the, when that translation came out. And so he encouraged all the Baptists to read through the Living Bible in a year. You know, take the year and read the Living Bible. So there's this one couple. They started reading the Living Bible, first time they'd ever done it, spent the whole year, and they start reading about scriptures about the Holy Spirit. Scriptures they've never heard before in their life. Never heard it preached about nothing. And they're thinking, why are we not seeing this? Why do we not ever hear about this in our church? So they went to their pastor. They said, <laughs> I mean, we're reading in the Bible about the Holy Spirit and the, their, their pastor said, well, I'm not spirit-filled. And I haven't even really studied about the Holy Spirit, to be honest with you. But if you want to, just go right on ahead and study it. Well, they did. And they got the truth of the Word of God on it, and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. But see, some people let tradition rob them. Can I just read you some scriptures about... Are you getting anything out of this? I just, praise the Lord, we're almost, we're almost done, kind of. <laughs> kind of. Look, take, take my time. Boy, I've heard that like several times. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I think that's the Holy Spirit talking to me. Right. Right. Y'all are over in Colossians 2. Let me just read this one to you, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. I'm just going to read you a few scriptures that talk about tradition, tradition. It says in this, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, it says, Therefore, brethren... Now, now this, is a good, this is a good tradition. He said, Stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. See, there are good traditions, but the good traditions are the one that you find from the Word of God. You know what I'm saying? When you, when you see it in the Word, like salvation, I'm holding to that. Why? Because that is in line with God's Word. It's not contrary to the Word. But are you in Colossians? Let me read this to you. Colossians 2, verse 7, it says, Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, Beware, lest any man spoil you. What does that mean? Have you ever had food? You know, you left it out on the counter overnight. You forgot about it. You forgot to put it in the refrigerator. And you come in there the next morning and you're like, Oh, man, it's spoiled. What does that mean? It, it's no good anymore. Your thinking... 
your believing can be spoiled, ruined. How? Well, it says it right here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So traditions that are not based in Jesus, not based in His finished work, traditions that are not based on the truth of God's Word can ruin you, can rob you, rob you of things that God intended for you to have, like healing. You know, Norville Hayes, when he was at our church, he was talking uh, to us about his mother. And his mother... um, was in, I think, the Baptist church and needed a healing from God and they told her she couldn't have one. He said, my mother was robbed of her healing because of religious tradition. It's happening to people everywhere and a lot of people are being robbed of the joy and the equipping of the experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Why? Our church don't preach that. Well, they should because it's in the Bible. I should be getting bitter amens tonight. (laughs) <laughs> let me just read a few more of these and then, and then we'll close Matthew 15 3 uh, it says but Jesus answered and said unto them why do, ye all, why do you also transgress the commandment of God how? by your tradition he said your traditions are causing you to transgress the commandments of God. We don't have time to go into it, but did you know that Paul said that his religious tradition is what caused him to go kill the Christians? Don't be bragging about religious tradition. Because it is not always good. In fact, I have found that the more traditional and steeped in religion people are, they're mean as a snake. They're the most judgmental. They're the most self-righteous people. Is that not the truth? I don't want it. I remember Brother Hagin talking about he had an experience with the Lord and and God took some ugly looking thing out of him and had tentacles and he said, what's that? God said, that's your Baptist tradition. Yeah. And then the Lord pulled something else out of him. He goes, what's that? He goes, that's your Pentecostal tradition. (laughs) See, Pentecostals have it too. The Pentecostals have it about righteousness. I was raised Pentecostal. I mean, we did everything but handle snakes. <laughs> we left the snake handle into those people down in Kentucky somewhere. We, did, we, didn't, we didn't mess with that. But we did everything else. But I'm going to tell you something. We thought, man, you had to you know, have your hair a certain length, your skirt a certain length, couldn't have a TV in your house. My great-grandmother, I'll never forget, my great-grandmother had a TV in the back room of her house and she watched it to watch Jimmy Swaggart and the news. That's like a band or something, Huey Lewis in the news. This was Jimmy Swaggart in the news. And when she wasn't watching it, she'd take a blanket and she'd put it over that (laughs) sinful TV.
And my papa, who was her son-in-law, he said, that's just ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. And it was ridiculous. But see, that's how we thought we had to be righteous. And I'll never forget when I got a hold of the revelation that he who knew no sin was made sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Are you kidding me? I'll never forget that day. I mean, I went home stunned. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're saying this. I was at Bible school. I cannot believe they're saying this. And my my instructor said, and I am as righteous as Jesus. And I thought, oh my gosh. (laughs) Oh my gosh, how could you say such a thing? But I had to make a choice. I had to make a spiritual choice, a spiritual decision. Am I going to believe the Word of God? Because, I mean, they gave me a ton of scriptures that day. And I went home and I'm reading it and I'm thinking, this is true. Oh my gosh, this is true. That faith in Jesus Christ makes me righteous. And I went back and I told my great-grandmother, you know what she said? I don't believe any of that. I tell you what, I think they're just trying to make it too easy to be saved. (laughs) That's that greasy grace. They're just trying to make it too easy. (laughs) But I had a choice. I had a choice. Which way am I going here? Which way am I going here? Am I going to hold the tradition? Because tradition says I need to throw my TV out the back door (laughs) and quit going to the movies. (laughs) I went and watched Home Alone. Oh my gosh, I'm going to hell. (laughs) Or do we hold to the Word of God? Let me just read you, let me read you another one and, and then, we'll, then we're, we're going to keep, we're going we're gonna to close this out. Listen to this one, Mark seven thirteen. It says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. The powerful word of God the powerful revelation of healing, prosperity, righteousness, the revelation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the fullness of the Spirit, you make it of none effect when you hold to the tradition instead of the Word. How do we make these choices? I, let, let me just read to you. Go over to Acts uh, 17. Go to Acts 17. We'll, we'll probably close with this. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Yes. I, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. I was hoping you would. Glory to God. Acts 17, 10. What's the right way? What's the right way to make our decisions about the fullness of the Spirit, prosperity, healing, miracles, impartation, you know, all these things. Right here, Acts 17, 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word Look at this, with all readiness of mind. So here you see an openness in their heart to receive the word. They're not prejudging anything. They're not prejudiced against the things that are being said. Well, I don't know about that stuff. No. They receive the word with all readiness of mind. And look at this. 
They search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That's how you base your spiritual cho choices. Right here. On one thing. What is it? The Word of God. Well, I'll tell you what, I think that baptism of the Holy Ghost, stuff, I think that's just weird. I think that was all done away with. I don't think that's for everybody. That does not agree with the Word. That doesn't agree with the Word. And, and so we, we just, and I know I'm not speaking to everybody here, because I know a lot of people are, are open to the fullness of the Spirit of God, or you probably wouldn't go to our church. <laughs> you know, some people wouldn't tolerate it that long. But even for those of us who believe it, I think it's good to know why you believe what you believe. When, when I went to Bible school, that was, that was one of the things that I wanted. I want to know why I believe what I believe. And that happened in my life. I got a good foundation from the scriptures in miracles, healing, salvation being through one, Jesus Christ, no other way. And about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in my life and in the church. And so, like I said, this isn't probably for everybody, but I think it's just good for us moving forward to know what's the standard. What's the test? What, what, what test does all the preaching from this pulpit have to meet? I'm talking us, Marquis, Brother Ed, Martin, John, whoever stands up here. Guest ministers. How about the TV preachers? Boy, there's a lot of TV preachers. A lot of prophets now. A lot of prophecies. A lot of visions. A lot of dreams. Well, you know, it, it's on that station I, I trust I trust brother Copeland if it's on his station I believe it uh, you better not believe it just because it's on brother Copeland's station he would tell you not to just swallow it because it's on his station no he would say put it to the test put it to the test of God's word and so I'm going to close with that thought tonight. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you're passing on it, why? If over the next couple of weeks I can show you in the Scriptures that it's for you, and you still say no, is it because you're just not interested? It's just because you pride tells you you don't need the Holy Spirit? Is it because you're trying to fit in with the world? Is it because you're holding on to your religious tradition from the past? That's between you and God. I'm not scolding anybody. It's so quiet in here. I'm not scolding anybody. I, I just I want us to think about why we make the spiritual choices we make because I'm telling you, God's doing something right now. He's doing something right now and you don't want to miss it. You don't want your family to miss out. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I, I, I've got three boys and I've got a daughter-in-law. I want them to see me go all the way with God. Mm -hmm. I do. Yes. I want to be an example for them. And I, we're not perfect, but in the yieldedness that I have towards God being sold out, I want them to be able to look at that and, and say, I want to be like that. I want to, I want to follow that. Amen. We are all leading somebody spiritually. Our home, uh, a family member, there's people that look to you and they need, telling you, they need God to move in their life. 
we need to be open to the fullness of the Holy Spirit.